Hello, friends, and welcome to the Medicine Stories podcast. I am your host, Amber Magnolia Hill. This is episode 18. Today, I am interviewing my very good friend, Susie Hazen. This is going to be a pretty short intro. Not a lot to say. I just returned from the Good Medicine Confluence in Durango, Colorado, where I taught classes, took classes, struggled to get my toddler to sleep in a new place, flew on four airplanes, and was reminded how much I hate air travel and how incredibly hard it is. But the whole experience was just just amazing. The level of classes there um, are top-notch, and I'm inspired by a lot of new things, new ideas, and we'll have some new podcast guests for you, um, thanks to the connections that I made there. So today, Susie and I, we talk about, we talk about a lot of things, um, health mostly, motherhood, sex, partnership. Uh, Susie is a radically honest person, and I love that about her. If you're not already following her on Instagram, S-U-U-Z-I-H-A-Z-E-N, uh, lots of radically honest posts there. Um, we talk about food, our time as vegetarians and vegans, why we are no longer vegetarians and vegans. We talk about different organ systems in the body. Sometimes I forget just how much Susie knows until we get into these really deep conversations, which we haven't had the chance to do really in years because our children are always around. Um, I'm so grateful for what we learned, what I learned from her during this conversation and also excited to get to talk more about food on the podcast. It's not really something I've done yet and it's something I'm always thinking about and researching and experimenting with. So um, we talk also about liver and eating cow liver, specifically beef liver. Susie has a company called uh, Mother's Best Liver Pills where she manufactures capsules of um, dehydrated and powdered grass-fed beef liver, which is one of, if not the most nutrient-dense foods you can eat, I think liver is the most nutrient-dense food you can eat. And if you're getting it from um, grass-fed animals, then all the better. I mean, I don't eat it at all from grain-fed animals. I don't know if anyone even tries to make that as a product, either the livers themselves or the pills, but um, of course you want it grass-fed. And Yeah, you know, we just, we go into our stories of how we became people who eat the organs of animals or take the pills because, you know what, we all know liver is not so fun to eat. Um, So I was so excited when Susie started encapsulating these. She had been doing placenta encapsulation and it's, you know, very similar organ, really, very, and the same process. So it was really exciting for me a few years ago when she started encapsulating free-range, grass-fed beef livers, and um, it's really made a difference in my health to take them. If you're tired in any way, anemic, a mother, pregnant, um, kids love them too. We talk about that. So Susie is giving away a bottle of, of these Mother's Best Liver Pills on Patreon. You can check that out at patreon.com slash medicine stories. It is for people at the $2 a month and up support level. Thank you so much for supporting my show. It means everything. I'm so excited to get back into it. I have a bunch of guests um, lined up already for the summertime and so many exciting things to talk about. Uh, Yeah, that's it. I'm short on time this morning. I'm anxious to get this show out since I went to the confluence. Um, Everything's a little behind schedule. So is that it? That's it. Facebook group, Medicine Stories. It's awesome. We talk about things that are talked about here on the show. Uh, The Mythic Medicinal Shop is reopen, mythicmedicine.love, and we are making a ton of new medicine right now. My (laughs) countertops are full of gallon and half gallon jars steeping with California poppy tincture, rose tincture, rose oil, hawthorn tincture. We are harvesting your basanta today. We're going to get mugwort and yarrow soon. Um, So all 
all the medicines that are currently out of stock will be restocked over the coming months. The first St. John's wort flowered recently. Um, oh, I can't wait to see more of that. We're going to be making more of the plantain and uh, chickweed salve and the breast oil is going to be back soon. We're going to make a lot more because it sold out so quickly last year. Um, so stay tuned. Follow me on Instagram at Mythic Medicine if you don't already. And you can sign up for my newsletter also at mythicmedicine.love by taking the quiz, which magical herb is your spirit plant, which will pop up. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to get rid of the constant pop-ups on my website. It's kind of complicated though with like the code injections and things I don't understand about website making, um, but it's there if you go to mythicmedicine.love. So yeah, okay, let's, let's talk to Susie Hazen. Okay. Hi, Suze. Hi. Hi. Um, let me let me turn off my phone. <laughs> All right. It's you and me. We're here in the little room where I record. I haven't had someone else in here with me since I interviewed Mila for the first ever interview. I love that. That puts me in the footsteps of glory here. Yes. You are sitting right where she's at. Mm, I can feel her beautiful vibration surrounding me. <laughs> As it always does. Uh, Mila. Yeah, she's amazing for everyone that hasn't met her. I feel, well, I don't want to say I feel bad for you. That sounds terrible. But she <laughs> is as awesome as she seems online. She's obviously way better because in person, she's a nuanced person. Whereas online, there's just one, you know, you can't smell her. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, you always make me laugh. Um, Yes the internet oh my goodness world that we all wrestle with that we push and pull Mm -hmm. um just talking about that a few minutes ago talking about how um I don't like looking at my phone (laughs) when I said that to you and I realized what a limiting um statement that is because if I don't like looking at my phone how am I gonna you know just do the things that a modern person needs to do so kind of excited to um, unpack that and make some positive changes in that regard. I know what you mean, though. Like, I, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of now not really, for the most part, not even looking at my phone after like 6 or 7 p.m. After a whole day of like constant. Just on and off. Yeah. yeah yes. Yeah. Yes. It hurts. And it's starting to bother my eyes more. Yes. That's the minute I look at the screen, my eyes start to feel kind of dry and almost they feel red. Mm-hmm. And I can just, I have used those, um, you know, blue light blocker glasses yeah, yeah. and those actually are really good. I need to get those out again. Yeah. Well, and when you update beyond the iPhone 5, there's, you can red shift the screen after, well, anytime, You're but right. after dark. And yes. I do yes. that and I love that. And so I've always had perfect vision and I can just feel it starting to slip. You know, I'm 37 too. Uh-huh. But one thing I'm doing that I learned from Katie Bowman, who was the guest on episode 10, is long distance looking whenever yes. I can. Yes. So looking at the farthest away point that you can see, taking breaks throughout the day to do that because it really actually helps to prevent myopia and keep your eyes sharp. Yes, just like our ancestors did. They were always looking at the landscape rather than just sitting in a fixed position hunched over some sort of project or screen Mm -hmm. um we're just not cut out for it yeah all right I'd love to talk about that stuff more but I also really like it when we tell the story about how we met oh okay (laughs) so let's see so I'll how about I'll tell my version okay you can chime in Mm -hmm. so this was in 2000 Seven? Seven or eight, yeah. Yeah, and so I was still living in Canada at the time. I was in a very exciting relationship with my boyfriend, who's now my husband. And um, I met him. Uh, He was a successful kind of indie musician at the time, and I interviewed his band. Hella. Hella. Um, If there's any music nerds out there, you'll know that band is still pretty legendary. I mean, Mm -hmm. they were so good. Oh, my God, so sexy on stage I mean it was oh my god you guys this was great so I was I was dating this super hot musician that I'm now married to um and I was at a party in Grass Valley with him I would come down to California to visit periodically and Amber was there 
And what happened next? <laughs> so my story starts before that. It was when <clears throat> my Celia, who's almost 12 now, was one. And I was with her over at our mutual friend, Care Beth and Tahiti's house. And she was playing with their daughter, Esme. And their hawthorn was blooming, just like the hawthorns are blooming right now. I just went to the cemetery in Nevada City today and spent some time with that big one. Um, but Spencer was there, and I met him for the first time. And um, and at some point, I ran down to Bonanza Liquor Store and grabbed some brandy because I wanted to tincture the hawthorn flowers. So Spencer came into the kitchen and saw me doing that and asked what I was doing. And he was like, you would love my fiancé. And he told me a little bit about you. <clears throat> I'm so grateful that my phone is bringing wonderful communications into my life. I'm going to turn it off right now. <laughs> Thank you, phone. Sorry about that. Um, and then, yeah, like sometime later, because it was when they had moved to their other house, was their yeah. like summertime yes, gathering. That was, Cara- that was through Carabeth and Tahiti too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so we met, and you were wearing a fabulous outfit, and I took a photograph of you and Spencer together, which foreshadowed our future of you modeling so much for me when I was doing vintage with Violet Folklore. Oh my goodness, the most fun photo shoots, and you always brought the best snacks. (laughs) Yeah, that was great. Yes, and so you were lugging my Celia out, and you had... So it was, like, too late. She was yeah. past her bedtime. Yeah, we had stayed. Fine. It was summer and warm out, even you though had, it was you night. Know, you had all that mom stuff, yeah. right? Like, who even knows what the hell moms have? But we yep. always have, like, three massive bags. Mm-hmm. And you had this baby car seat bags, and I obviously just went to help you. You and... offered to help. No one else, okay? A house full of people. Oh, my God. Don't no one's paying started. attention. And this... Brand new person who I just met asks if she can help me out, mm. and that, that it was fate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, well, yeah, and you know what? In that moment, we bonded because I could tell you needed help. I offered help, and you accepted it. So we started uh, to exchange energy. Mm-hmm. You know, and that to me, when you help a friend, do some work with them, that's when you really start to connect. It's not just through chatting or. I don't know, going out for coffee together. I mean, that's fine, but I would way rather wash a friend's dishes. I mean, that's, to me, that's a relationship. Yeah, you know, I've been wanting to tell you something I heard on um, Duncan Trussell's podcast. Mm-hmm. Duncan. Dunky. Duncan. <laughs> I love him. Um, he was interviewing Will Oldham, who's been one of my favorite musicians for a very long time, and they were talking about how they both enjoy doing other people's dishes and yes. enjoy being the dish doers. <laughs> After gatherings, and I hate doing my own dishes and other people's dishes even more. I I just really don't like it. And they were talking about how, like, that's okay. Some people aren't the dish doers, and some people are the dish doers. And we all have this, you know, they got very philosophical going off on this dish doing thing and it just made me think of you because you you're a dish doer i am oh my god that's that's beautiful it's actually making my nipples hard right now (laughs) thinking about those two men doing dishes yeah literally my nipples are getting hard because you know your body responds to oh my god i need to loosen my bra um i'm nursing my nipples don't get hard anymore you know what okay (laughs) i want to break in and say something right now so you know i've breastfed two kids Um, stopped breastfeeding my second and one of the for me tragedies of breastfeeding that I've bemoaned to you was that I my breasts lost their erogenous function during Mm -hmm. that time I did not want my husband on them in any way and that really sucked because previous to having kids my breasts were like 75 percent of my turn on was Mm -hmm. like you know really solid long nipple (laughs) stimulation just like get on there and go so that really sucked and I didn't know if it would ever come back because it did not come back between the two kids Mm. but now it is coming back Amber it is coming back I you know I want him to kind of like hold my breast and like just give sort of a firm squeeze to the breast and then just a little gentle (laughs) nipple action I'm not ready for a total mouth stimulation yet but I think I will be again and I'm so excited because my sexuality just was not active during the years of breastfeeding and I'm so grateful to feel that pleasure again yeah my body coming alive and 
a part of me that that was gone is now coming back. It's so, I mean, it's just biology, right? That our, we completely turn off from sexuality when we are nursing a baby. Yes. And I remember with my oldest, when she stopped... It took a while, it took a few months or maybe even a year, just all of a sudden it came back to me and I was like, yeah, like alive again in this, in this way, this deep erotic charge that just yes. felt very, I don't know, earthy. And yeah, you know, I just felt like tuned into the world in a different way. Absolutely. I look forward to feeling that again. Yes. Yes. I am excited for you to experience that too. But it seems like you and Owen have managed to keep the connection you know, trucking along during this time, which is good. Yeah. Yeah, we've done pretty good. Yeah, yeah, I didn't, I didn't, oh, just was not able to keep a healthy sexual communication going during those years when I was not feeling it. And thank God the marriage survived because now we're getting to enjoy that again. But yeah, I wasn't, it, that didn't work out for me, so... Well, I knew from my first. Mm -hmm. You know, I was more prepared, and I prepared him, and... Yes. Yeah. Yeah, see, I did not know. I was shocked at six weeks with my first son when I tried to have sex again. I was like, why isn't my vagina wet? <laughs> my God, I, I just did not know that your sex drive drops when you're breastfeeding and when you have an infant. I literally did not know, mm. and I... It was like... For one thing, the information isn't that prevalently available, but also I think I just had filtered it out mm. over the years because that was so confusing to me. It didn't make sense. And so you can't just you just can't wrap your mind around what it actually means to have a child until you do it. Also, that's so true. Just the the fact of having a massive responsibility 24 seven. And if you're not watching the kid, either your partner, if you have the good fortune to have one, your partner is, and you've had to schedule that. Mm -hmm. And if they're not watching it, someone else is, and you have to schedule that too. And which, pay for it, and unless for you're it. very lucky and yes. have family nearby. Yes. And then just the physiological changes too. Yes. You just, you can't, you can't know. <laughs> no, no. <sighs> Well, maybe some women are listening to this right now and won't be a surprise for them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so, yeah, yeah, that's, it's just, it's crazy how little we know, just in general. Okay, so not yes. just around childbirth and stuff, but basic tenets of that and, like, human health and having a body. Um, how little this really basic human wisdom that almost every generation before us had has like trickled down mm -hmm. um <clears throat> yes it's been it was cut off at the knees by medicine and i'd say industrialized agriculture mm -hmm. and religion mm -hmm. just a nice trio of the three just mm -hmm. cutting in on the health spirituality and land-based connection just gone just live in an apartment if you're sick go to the doctor and don't talk about it mm -hmm. yes <laughs> And that's something, um, yeah, I think you were one of my first friends that we talked about this yes, stuff you were together. one of my first friends, too, who was actually interested in, you know, primal slash primitive human lifestyle, um, hunter-gatherer culture, and gleaning the, the gems from that that we could apply to understand our own needs and behaviors, which seems so at odds with industrialized society. You were really one of my first friends. I remember you told me, Oh, yeah, across the board, hunter-gatherers nurse their children to between age three and five. And literally, my jaw dropped because I was like, oh, I thought it was going to be maybe six months. Mm -hmm. Well, I went on to breastfeed for two years for both kids. But, you know, thank God you told me that. So I was able to learn more and just have a broader picture. Right. Because, yeah, we get handed these tiny little windows of possibility from our culture yes and they don't fit and they don't work because we physiologically are the same human animal that we were in the paleolithic exactly. so when we try to fit these new contrived 
made up like cultural norms onto our own biology. Oh, we just become these twisted, like almost like golem like creatures, you know, (laughs) like the body looks like shit mentally and emotionally. The behavior is terrible. We feel awful. We feel bad. Yes. We just tear each other apart and tear ourselves apart. I, I think to me the inner dialogue that a lot of us are breaking free from feeling like we are not good enough, that we're wrong, just for basic human feelings Mm -hmm. that are just part of being, as you said, an animal that was used to a group living lifestyle Mm -hmm. on the land. Mm -hmm. And we've now culturally lost both of those things, although within our own lives, a lot of us are recultivating that community with our blood family as well as our friends and then the land-based connection through all of our amazing permaculture and gardening projects and our wild crafting. I mean, we're doing pretty good. We're lucky to live where we do. We are. We're incredibly lucky. We really are. And something I think about all the time with like Instagram and this podcast is that most people are living in an just urban. in like, yeah, middle yeah. America where, yeah. where they're not surrounded by the culture that we are here in Northern California. Um, I wanted to take something you just said a little bit further because I thought this was so interesting. I've been diving into the work of Dr. Zach Bush, and it's Z-A-C-H, if you want to listen to every podcast he's been interviewed on, which I've been doing, with the microbiome. And something he said is that, so, you know, basically, we all have disturbed microbiomes. Um, maybe some young kids don't like Nixie because she well, has the minute they get in the dirt with a stick mm-hmm. yeah. but that's then that's that's not a disturbed microbiome that's uh-huh. a fed microbiome um but like anyone yes, our generation is you yes. know all, all sorts of reasons um and that the microbiome you know because it's in the gut and because it's such a huge part of the immune system is literally what helps us differentiate self from other mm. as the immune system does. And so he was speaking about just kind of like this loss of sense of self that so many people are feeling and even gave the example of like the Las Vegas mass shooter. And he's like, I think we're going to be seeing more and more like extreme acts like this as people literally aren't themselves anymore because their gut microbiome microbiome is not. It's so it's number one, completely disconnected from the landscape Mm -hmm. because we should all have a microbiome that reflects our local landscape. So it's disconnected from that. And then it's also just disconnected from life force Mm -hmm. because people that are living on an industrialized diet, I mean, there's no vitality in that food. Right. And yet somehow every day you're just running on fumes. And we know the feeling because we we used to eat that diet too. Yeah, I wanted to talk about both of our food evolution. Um, I've also been just learning so much about the mitochondria, which are the tiny little powerhouses inside every single cell in the body. About 10% of your body weight is mitochondria. You inherit it only from your mother. It's so fat. I could talk about it for a Thanks, long time. Mom. I know. Yeah, and and her mom and her mom and her mom and her mom. Um, yes. And yeah, the, the modern ways that we're living just is like literally killing draining the life force draining the energy vitality and health from our mitochondria like all degenerative diseases are mitochondrial based cancer diabetes heart disease autoimmune diseases diseases, which is Mm -hmm. like the new infectious disease yes you know i think almost all of us have some manifestations not not Mm -hmm. everyone but Oh, it's so common. Most, I think most people and more and more often, like just this year, yes. my allergies were so much worse. And I was like, oh yeah, this is autoimmune. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. And well, I mean, we don't have to get into this right now, but my rash, mm-hmm. um, I about three or four weeks ago developed full facial hives. Um, so I'm now on a wondrous healing journey of unraveling that. And I mean, for me, the trigger was stress. So I don't necessarily know exactly what to say, except that I'm completely changing how I live my life because I can't keep circulating these stressful, negative, overwhelmed feelings. I just, I can't do that anymore. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Stress like that, just like normal shit. Yes. Living as a person stress. Living a great life. But it's very real stress and it has very real effects on your mitochondria and your telomeres. And it's like it's not just some fluffy thing that like you got you gotta de-stress. It's so real. It's like, okay, I have facial hives now. 
is this going to be cancer next year? Right. That's what I'm, I mean, I know enough about medicine as you do too, to know that nothing that happens in your body should be ignored. Mm -hmm. The littlest twinge, you need to pay attention. Oh, my shoulder hurts. Okay. I'm not going to do overhead lifts today. I'm going to massage it. I'm going to go take a long, you know, just, you have to pay attention now. These things don't go away. They either get worse or they transform further inside your body to something really destructive and negative and that's a lesson I've just been hit in the face with over the course of my life. I'm vigorously nodding my yes, head. Um, as you know I've been listening to a lot of Bulletproof Radio and Dave Asprey this is something he says and writes about a lot like every every little thing that happens in your body has a meaning. Yes. No, and none of it is random. Yes. And kind of separately from hearing him say that so much lately, I had this profound realization, which is funny to say, because it's so fucking basic. And it's so funny that it took me this long <laughs> to figure it out or to, to finally accept it as true in my heart, um, that everything I do affects my health. Mm -hmm. Every, the, oh, I'm just going to have tortilla chips for lunch just today because I'm just so busy and there's nothing else to do. Over time, like such an effect on my health. And um, yeah, just ev every little thing I do is going to manifest in some way in my body. Yes. Yes. It's, you know, growing up, we were fed the Western medical model, which compartmentalizes the body into these different systems. Well, mm. it's total bullshit. Mm -hmm. um, and an interesting aside on that is, you know, the foundation of Western medicine is cadaver studies. Right. That's something that <laughs> a lot of people don't necessarily know, but when Western medicine, as it is now, branched away from the other forms of medicine that were being practiced at a time, it was because they were cutting open dead bodies and mapping the structures. Oh my God. And literally that's what it's based on. Yeah. Dead bodies, not wow. alive bodies, not wow. alive bodies. And mm -hmm. so for, I mean, people, it's been interesting talking about my rash. I'm like, oh, it was caused by stress. People are like, are you sure you didn't eat the wrong thing? Or is it an allergy? I'm like, my goodness, people like, of course, stress could cause literally almost anything to happen mm -hmm. to you. It could cause your back to go out. It could cause you to have IBS. It could cause you to have anxiety. It could cause you to get a wrist injury. I mean, it just, all these things flow through our bodies and they, you know, your lungs affect your bowels, your skin. I mean, it's all, it's a holistic, we are a holistic entity. Um, and that is a, I mean, that understanding from that just flows forth a thousand realizations mm -hmm. and possibilities and opportunities for change. Um, so I, yeah, I want to hear your background with food, healing, everything. Okay, sure, sure. Um, so I've always been a person that wanted to be healthy, quote unquote, <laughs> just, you know, it was just something that I knew I wanted to be healthy. And so, um, when I got out of high school and kind of went out on my own, I was at college and um, I was living in the dorms and eating the cafeteria food there, which was just, you know, not healthy. And I met a friend, um, this fabulous, wild, redheaded girl from one of the Gulf Islands off the coast. And she was vegetarian and she was like, hello, become vegetarian. It's so healthy. And I was like, yes. And I think, you know, those were the early days of the internet. I don't even know, but somehow I watched a few PETA videos. And of course, I had been around agriculture since childhood. I've been inside those cow barns and those chicken barns. I have seen them. Um, you know, my friends and my parents' friends ran those places. Very nice people run those places. Anyways, um, so I became vegetarian and that went on for about eight years, <laughs> by the end of which my body was breaking down. I mean, I was only 25. I had a spontaneous, quote unquote, abscess in one of my teeth. I lost a tooth. Um, I was having all this joint pain and I had no energy. Oh my goodness. Um, I was doing a bunch of acupuncture and Chinese medicine to try and deal with that stuff. Um, and all the practitioners Everyone just said to me, you have blood deficiency, you need chicken soup. And it took a really long time before I accepted that because I'd become very um, 
very rigid in my thinking that meat is murder. I truly believed that for years. And so it took a couple of years to unravel it. And then once I started eating meat again, I discovered, first of all, that there's really wonderful ethical options available now, which weren't as available Mm -hmm. earlier. And then shortly afterwards, I moved to a farm and started growing my own stuff and raising and harvesting my own animals. So that was a whole other level of connection. Mm -hmm. Um, And man, there's a lot more on that food journey with sugar, with addictive eating um, that has been, oh, that's been a journey for me my whole life. Um, Overeating sweets. And man, I've just really come a long way where that's not really something I do anymore. But I'd say the years that I did do that had a strong effect on my gut. When were those years and all this? Um, Probably childhood through my mid-20s. I think in my mid-20s was the first time I really heard the idea that sugar is bad for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in the 80s, fat was the culprit, right? Mm -hmm. The 80s and 90s, it was Mm -hmm. all fat, fat, fat. So then I I think I remember I was very involved with kundalini yoga at the time, and some of my friends were doing 10 days off of sugar. Oh, that was so hard, Mm -hmm. but I couldn't believe how good I felt afterwards. And then I just kind of started chipping away at it like that, just, you know, I'd go off of it and then try and have it just a little bit here and there, then it would get more again, then I'd go off of it again, and just a journey of, you know, kind of one, two steps forward, one step back, and also unraveling the emotional side of craving sweets. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. (laughs) It's interesting how similar, in some ways, um, our paths have been. So I never really liked meat as a kid, and I actually think it had more to do with my parents not cooking it not cooking it well. correctly because yes. it was like a texture chewiness uh-huh. thing um and when I was 12 I made friends with this girl no like seven or eight is when I made friends with her and she came over to my house and she was like oh, I don't eat meat and I was like wait you can just not yeah. eat meat and so I told my parents like I'm a vegetarian now and they're like no you're not <laughs> And so I wasn't. Um, But then when I was 12, I realized that that wasn't their decision anymore. Um, So I became a vegetarian. Really? You were 12? Uh Uh-huh. I didn't know you were that young. Yeah. And I remember eating turkey when I was 16, just like some cold cut in the fridge. I remember just standing there looking at it and being like, I really want this right now. I think I'm going to eat it. And then not too long after that, I went full vegan. Wow. Um, And it's funny because for me, it wasn't an animal rights thing. I wasn't even really aware of that. Mm. And it wasn't a um, health thing so much either as Mm. just like, I don't like meat. Don't like the way it's Yeah. (laughs) Um, Except people have pointed out that I did eat bacon and pepperoni during these years. You and bacon. At at some point. You and bacon. You are a bacon queen. I I love love pigs. I love pork. Did we talk about this one? Yes. You you feel just a resonance with A very ancestral thing with. With pigs pork. yeah our next door neighbors just got pigs and we went over there and i'm just awesome. in love with them are they gonna slaughter them on mm-hmm. property maybe yeah. you guys can go and lend a hand I, but i don't want to do that Susie. Oh, see i God. this is a facet yes. of all this that i have not integrated that you so have we actually thought they were killing one the other day because it was squealing. squealing so loud for so Ooh. long and i was just was like covering my ears and yeah that's the way you don't want it to go um but i to... in the in those um foxfire books mm-hmm. which yeah, in the like those. 70s um some uh college kids and i think south carolina interviewed all these old timers in the appalachian mountains about the old ways of living it's a 12 volume set yes. and i have it and i just remember oh, turning it to this page of these people standing around a, a pig carcass hanging up and yeah. just looking at it and being like that's I, me yeah i've been there Ooh, those are my people ancestors in the south too on my dad's side yeah. both my grandparents were born in the south and forever every generation going back yes the ancestors double and they're all in the south yes. forever um yes, okay so me. totally vegan through my late teens and early 20s, oh, no. I get through college. I'm a fucking mess, okay? Anxiety attacks, um, cutting myself, 
depression. I gained like 20 pounds my freshman year of college. Oh. So just eating total shit. Yeah, just a lot of carbs. Yeah, white white tortillas mm-hmm. like every single day. Sometimes just with peanut butter and honey yes. inside. Sometimes with beans cereal and cheese. Cereal yeah. every morning. Uh-huh. Every morning. Um, mm. And like Taco Bell. So much Taco Bell. <laughs> my whole life. <laughs> So much Taco Bell. Um, I never prepared my own food. I wasn't taught how to prepare food at all. It really yeah, wasn't neither. modeled for me. My parents didn't teach me. I had to teach myself, man. But I dug into that. One. Yeah, I you did. It. But okay, please go back. So then graduated college and got a job at the Sacramento Natural Foods Co-op. Vegan the whole time. And then I got pregnant at the end oh, of my first year there. Goodness. Vegan pregnancy. Vegan <gasps> pregnancy. It's like a Homo sapiens nightmare. Yeah, it it goes against all of our nature in every single way. So then, had the baby. Oh, there's this one time when I was pregnant though, and so the the man at the time was also like vegan, staunch, hardcore vegan, and we had gone to the co-op in Sacramento, and I was like, I really want some cottage cheese and I bought some and I remember in the car afterward he was so mad at me and just like going off on me and I was just like I just need this fucking cottage cheese bro yeah (laughs) I'm gonna eat this cottage cheese um so seven months postpartum I started an herbal apprenticeship called cultivating the medicine woman within with Cammie McBride Mm -hmm. who is going to be on the podcast coming up she's she's my first herb teacher ever and I just love her and I think the second or third class I was sitting there at lunch and she sat down next to me and looked me in the eye and said, you're vegan, aren't you? And I said, yeah. And she was like, I can tell. And I can tell it's not working for you. Uh, You are a postpartum breastfeeding woman and you need animal fats and proteins, but mostly fats to nourish you through this time. And I was just like drinking it in. I'd been thinking for the last couple months that I really wanted bacon. And um and but I was afraid to say something sure. to my partner. Of course. And so she's like, if I go get you some sardines out of my house right now, will you eat them? And I was like, yeah. <clears throat> that is so loving of her. I love her for doing that because that was bold, you and, know? And she even broke the seal for you by just giving because that yeah. first time you yeah. eat meat after being vegan or yeah. vegetarian for a long time is a really it can be hard to break that yourself, but if someone lovingly gives you an animal food and says, Here, nourish yourself. That's so sweet. Yeah. And it's so easy for us in this culture to be like, whatever, it's her thing. But she was she was looking at me. I was yeah. emaciated. Oh, I'll tell you, I can spot them in a crowd too. It's, yeah. It's hard. I know. Because I was pale, 115 pounds, yeah. sallow, yes. you know, and pale, just yeah. no energy. My baby was just literally sucking yes. the life. I mean, She's I didn't have. marrow. Yes. Because I didn't have the reserves built up yes. to, to give her what she needed. Um, so she was taking, yeah, the minerals from my bones. And um, I, I, she really emboldened me to be a little more straightforward with people who I see yes. making really poor health decisions, too. Ooh, Amber, that's, that's good stuff because I always hold my tongue. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it's got, it's become such a more oh, it's so trendy right divisive now. issue. So trendy. I mean, it's like if you want to be cool, just like live off of green smoothies and put on some spandex and... Take a photo in front of a brick wall. Throw with, it online. With your athleisure. Oh, God. Mm. Um, I want to say, too, though, that when I got home from that day, that class, and told my partner, he was resistant at first. But then we started researching, and we found the Weston A. Price Foundation. Yes. And we found all these resources, like Nina Plank's book, Real Food, What to yes. Eat and Why, and other things. And we both just said a both 180. Changed. We were like, this is insane. I can't, yes. like, so here, here I was. I had this my first daughter. And I was like, I want to do this like my paleolithic ancestors did. I'm going to have a home birth. I'm going to co-sleep when she's really little. I'm going to breastfeed. I'm going to use plant medicines with her. I'm going to feed her whole foods. And somehow you forgot yourself. I, I left out the piece of eating animal foods is the most ancient human thing as well. I was like, I was like, I'm doing it all. But you like eating. my ancestors, except the food. Like that, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, that's you know that's a really common thing because I see the natural mothering movement. It's all focused on behavioral things that the mother can do. Mm. It's not focused on 
things other people can do for her. And it's cert- it's not even really focused on food either, except maybe like, you know, cook from scratch. Mm-hmm. But, well, thank thank God for bone broth because that is trending. Mm-hmm. Hard yeah. In the natural and that's a really um, easy thing for someone to it is. ease themselves back into animal foods if they want. Yes. And it just, bone broth is one of those things that, you know, when you drink it, you literally feel better right in that moment. Mm-hmm. You don't need to wait for a couple of weeks for it to kick in. You literally feel the life force of that animal just go directly through your digestive system into your own veins and you feel that energy and that's what our species as a, you know, what do they call us an opportunistic omnivore, mm-hmm. top level predator Mm -hmm. whatever we are that's that's what we thrive on Mm -hmm. we are natural born killers there's (laughs) no animal as good at killing things as humans and it's something that is so innate to us but it's that that has really been taken away by industrialized culture Mm -hmm. because they do not want us feeding ourselves they do not want men that are comfortable with guns and knives Mm -hmm. that's not how to run a big organized mass society at all let alone women. Yeah, exactly. Oh, my goodness. Oh, the comments I get from people when they find out that I kill animals myself is just, I mean, it's hurt my feelings a lot. Um, it doesn't really hurt my feelings as much now, but it just shows how limited people are and what they think women do. And, um, you know, I hope that I remember to remind people, well, okay, maybe you don't kill animals yourself, but your grandma did. Mm-hmm. I bet you almost a hundred percent your grandma did, and if not her, your great grandma. So yeah, um, in the episode sixteen interview with Sean Donahue, he talked about how he was a junk food vegetarian for so long, yes. which so many of us are. are. We're, we're not eating meat, but well, we're eating total processed shit food. I, I think that to me isn't so much of a difference between vegetarians and non-vegetarians. It's just everyone yeah. in our society bases their diet off of that. But then we remove meat, the right. foundational part. And so then we're just that much worse off. Yeah. Meat and fat. But the fat yes. is such a key element of yes. this. Um, but he talks about how that shifted for him when he realized there's not such a big difference between plant and animal, including human consciousness, mm-hmm. as we try to like pretend this. there is. Ooh, that is really juicy. It her. is. Yeah, because we just like to think, I mean, well, I know as a little girl, I felt bad for picking flowers and killing them, didn't you? <laughs> and some kids, I guess, never gave a shit. But I, yeah, I think some people can, well, I think all of us can tap into the underlying spirit of a plant and an animal, but, you know, we've just all seen too much Disney. <laughs> too much Disney, and that guy... <clears throat> he knew how to play with people's sentimentality, but I well, think then he killed Bambi's mom so. in a harsh way. Well, yeah. because that that's playing. That with hunter needed some some meat, Zeus. Well, but do you remember the details of how it all? Like the hunters are depicted as these cruel, cruel folks. Mm. And for one thing, they're harvesting a doe with a kid with well, not a kid, with a, a fawn. Mm-hmm. That's not that's not good. Hunting yeah, that practice. is cool. And also they start a fire in the woods oh, to yeah. drive the animals out. Yeah. No one does that except for like insane poachers, I guess. I mean, it's, yeah, not not very true to life in the actual hunting world mm-hmm. at all. Because all the hunters I know really try to cultivate animal um, habitat. Mm-hmm. It's a big deal. Right. Um, this reminds me, too, of what Susan Weed says about... About, like now I eat you now you eat me that mm-hmm. just nature is an ongoing cycle of death and consuming the bodies of other entities that is literally yes. the only thing that keeps the planet, the planet moving and any sort of species alive That's and nice. so to think that you can remove yourself from that cycle is like oh. the height of hubris it is and it's and it's so, so far removed from nature it's just, it's like placing yourself into the etheric realm yeah. rather than the earthly realm. And to me, that's a very weird kind of technological extension of the Western religious mindset, which is that there is this God and then there's us humans. We're separate, but we're always trying to be more like him. Mm-hmm. Whereas our traditional spirituality places us within a cooperative earth-based realm where 
different gods and spirits interact and are present, but they're not separate. Mm -hmm. Um, Another thing I've been considering with meat eating, I've just noticed there's this concept that eating meat is almost kind of dirty and unclean. Mm -hmm. There's all these different taboos, including um, the taboo against pork in the Muslim faith. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, And, you know, for people that have cultural systems like that, that is rewarding to um, participate in, I get that. I mean, this isn't, I'm not against that at all. But this thought that animal foods are unclean, and to me, that's an extension of the thought that our bodies are unclean, which is a big part of the major religions, almost all of them. The monotheistic The monotheistic ones, religions, mm-hmm. that our bodies are unclean and patriarchal. Mm-hmm. Um, and so by that... Especially women. As, oh my God, we're so dirty. Menstruating women. Oh, menstruating women with these terrible vulvas. <laughs> Um, yeah, I was spent a weekend recently with vegan relatives and everyone was so cool and awesome and lovely people, but I could just sense some, oh, who knows, who knows, but yeah, just this thought that there is something dirty about meat Mm -hmm. and I'd have to say from the point of view of someone that harvests animals, there's nothing dirty about it at all. Just all the blood. Well, you know, that's that's a really... I'm glad you brought that up because there's a lot less blood than people would think. I think there's this thought that, okay, when you cut open an animal's skin, there's going to be sort of this, like, explosion of blood and guts. Mm -hmm. Well, that happens if there's a car accident. But if you um, kill an animal cleanly, either by hunting or um, in some some sort of agricultural slaughter, you kill them in a way... Um, and then bleed them out, collect all the blood. And then from that point on, when you start butchering them, you keep the intestinal tract. You don't perforate that. Mm -hmm. So you should never have waste contaminating the carcass. I mean, really, you, you cut open the belly, you've bled open the neck, you cut open the belly. This is very typical for all large animals. And the guts just fall out. Mm -hmm. That's why it's called awful, Mm -hmm. awful. Fall, O-F-F-A-L-L. That's oh. the term for all the, um, you know, the the tripe, the intestines, the liver, the heart. It, it literally falls out. Mm. And then you're just left with a spotless carcass of meat. I mean, all the blood vessels, all that blood has come out through the neck. So it's very clean. Mm-hmm. Now, occasionally you will puncture the gut. Say if you're hunting and you your shot went into the gut as opposed to the lungs, or if you're butchering and you just screw up and nick the intestines, and that's not good, but, you know, it happens and you can deal with it. <clears throat> I think something a lot of people don't realize is that um, our hunter-gatherer ancestors went for the offal over the muscle meat. Today, yes. we basically only eat muscle meat, but the organ meats are so much more nutrient-dense. Exactly. They are the, in, in uh, Chinese medicine, they call the organs the, um, like the precious emperor's storehouses. So it's where the animal, um, and humans are the same way, we con- concentrate nutrients in these blood-rich organ tissues. The kidneys and the liver would be the main ones. The heart and the lungs also have this function too, but we concentrate nutrients there and then it gets parceled out through the bloodstream throughout the day and the night as you need it. So they, and and that truly is how our circulatory system works. Mm -hmm. So those organs are what hunter gatherers as well as agriculturalists would always eat first. You know, the day you butcher a pig, everyone eats liver. Mm -hmm. And um, that's also just a function of the way things work because those meats are very perishable. They can't really be preserved, Mm -hmm. except some, there are some methods where you will pack them in tallow or fat, but generally they need to be eaten right away. And that's what our ancestors, as well as all predatory animals, always do. Right. I mean, if anyone's found a carcass in the woods or had your cat bring something home, they'll dig into it, get the liver, and then sometimes they just throw the rest to the side. Well, I remember reading some uh, anthropological study in college of a modern hunter-gatherer band and saying that they just, they fed their dogs the muscle meat. Yes, yes, that's a very common pattern too. And a lot of um, hunter-gatherers 
Sometimes they did not have the ability to make broth from the large bones of big animals. They would definitely make broth from rabbits and squirrels and the smaller ones. Um, but yeah, they would just peel off the muscle meat. That would be for the dogs. And then often they would leave the bones there too. Well, they would crack them, eat the marrow, then mm-hmm. leave the bones. They couldn't make broth the way we do because they just did not have those long cooking abilities mm-hmm. or even the desire to do it. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's another stereotype that hunter-gatherers ate the entire animal nose to tail. I think they did sometimes, but then when there was plenty, I mean, like the Native Americans were famous for harvesting buffalo and just eating the liver, heart, and tongue mm-hmm. and leaving the rest. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it gets recycled and reused exactly. anyway by yes, the animals and plants. Sort of following right along. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of people are not going to eat animal organs. Yes. Okay. So, wow. All right. So let's talk about liver pills. Yeah. Um, probably most people already listening to this know that I, um, own a small business, Mother's Best Liver Pills, where we manufacture a hundred percent grass fed, um, beef liver concentrate, like beef liver in little pills. And I started making this um, because I wanted to eat liver without eating liver. I had I had a I had an inner voice speak to me and say, "You need liver." This happened when I was about a year postpartum with my son, my first son. I was still trying to recover from a less than ideal pregnancy, emergency C section, and. I just had this inner voice say to me, you need liver. And so I started trying to cook it for us. Um, And what I was really seeking was energy. That's what I really wanted from it. And I had always struggled with low energy pretty much my whole life. Just, Just would always kind of get tired. And of course, keep pushing myself. But anyways... I started trying to cook liver for us, and I just did not like it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the taste, you could not go further from the modern industrialized grain-based palate than liver. Mm -hmm. Because liver is just so rich, so meaty, so metallic with the Mm iron-like taste of it. It... Um, I just could not start liking it, and but that little inner voice would not shut up. And so I started making my own liver pills. And my business just blossomed from there. Um, Okay, let's talk about why eating the liver of an animal is not giving you all the toxins. Oh, the people say it does. Yes. Or or they, like, no one says that with any conviction or proof behind it. They're just worried if they don't know the truth. They just say, oh, the liver's a filter, right? It's full of toxins. (sighs) So, okay, Western medicine moment. Um, so Western medicine, I would say, is based on cadaver studies and pharmaceutical industry research. And something that pharmaceuticals do is they create liver damage. That's just across the board. All pharmaceuticals do. And, you know, if you're just if you're taking a little bit of a certain drug to deal with a certain condition, that's OK. But long term pharmaceutical use damages the liver because the liver is the organ that's responsible for essentially filtering the blood and then storing away precious substances within itself so that it can parcel them back out. This is in a state of health where you're eating a nutritious, um, omnivorous diet. So pharmaceutical firms really found that um, people's livers got very damaged from their drugs. I want to jump in here and say if anyone's worried about the drugs they or their loved ones are on right now, Dave Asprey's book, Headstrong, has a whole list of like every pharmaceutical and how it works in your body and damages your mitochondria or not, which is what the liver is feeding when it Mm -hmm. processes the blood that came from your intestines after your food has been digested and sends new blood out through the circulatory system. It's sending that blood to your mitochondria. that's why eating liver gives you so much energy Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because it's actually feeding those little... Yes. And I do want to say something else about pharmaceuticals. If anyone's listening to this and starting to panic or something, just calm down. Never make big changes in your life based on what you heard on a podcast right away. Do some more research, look into it. And if you are on a pharmaceutical and you're wanting to come off of it, 
that's going to be part of a bigger picture health plan that may, you know, that may take months or years. Yeah. And that section of Dave Asprey's book too, Headstrong, um, talks about like, okay, now don't freak out because yes. here's all the things you can do to counteract it. And here's yes. maybe some other alternatives. And I know a lot of people know they want to be done with pharmaceuticals at this point, I think so. I think so. Okay, so the liver... Um, okay, so the liver... So the pharmaceutical industry discovered that pharmaceuticals cause damage to the liver. Um, and then another train comes in, which is um, hardcore industrial egg. So the liver, number one, spoils very fast. So how do you get the liver from the animal to the consumer if you're slaughtering, you know, 50,000 cattle a day in Iowa and then trucking that meat all over the country, which is literally what's happening today in the States. So how do you get the liver there? And then also, if you've been um, raising animals in high intensity feeding operations where you're just cramming them with corn and soy, which is not their natural antibiotics diet, and it hormones. does damage their livers. <clears throat> so essentially, they, in the meat processing and marketing industry, um, they were finding that their animals have damaged livers, which actually are not really saleable on the market anymore. And if those livers are damaged, so is that muscle meat. Exactly. Oh God, exactly. But it doesn't show up in the muscle meat the same way. Mm -hmm. See, a liver from a confinement raised, or excuse me, I should say from a feedlot raised beef cow um, I actually freaked out a few months ago when I got a liver like this from in my business. I'd ordered some liver from a new supplier and they sent me their second rate stuff. And so I got a liver that was riddled with these little yellow pustules. And I remember I talked to you about mm -hmm. it. Was, for one thing, I was devastated because I'd spent like maybe $400 on mm -hmm. this order. And then I was just like, what? the hell is going on here and what do I do because in every animal I have ever butchered the liver has been perfect just a beautiful vermilion color firm texture no abscesses at all mm -hmm. and so what I learned about was um it's called um f the disease is called feedlot disease it's very common and it essentially it's like a almost like what in modern humans we would see as fatty liver but that's what's happening in the animals. So I feel like I'm taking a long time to explain. No, oh, I think it's you. so interesting. I remember when my yeah. my first daughter's father brought a liver home from Nevada County Free Range Beef, who oh. you get your livers from. Yes. And it was giant. And he had it out on the cutting board. You know, this was right after we changed our diet. And I was like, whoa, wow, it's gorgeous. It's like this burgundy yes. and it's just so Burned, vibrant silky. looking. Yeah, it's a beautiful organ. Yes. Yes, and these, I mean, livers of animals that have not been fed well, they will be kind of like a pale salmon color. They'll actually almost start to shred under your fingertips. And these animals, you know, if they didn't slaughter them after that 90 days, now I'm talking about beef cattle specifically, but if they did not slaughter them after that 90 days of confinement, um, corn and soy feeding, they would die anyways. Right. They're literally... I mean, the, the mainstream beef industry is, in some ways, there's still some good stuff because all those animals are still born out on the range, on ranch land. But when they grow out to a certain weight, the ranchers sell them to at auction mm -hmm. and then they go into these big confinement mm -hmm. places. So if you are shopping for good quality beef, it's not hard to find there's a handful of them but there's plenty of ranchers who they take them off the range and slaughter them at that point they don't put them through that 90 days of corn and mm -hmm. soy feeding then you've got a terrific quality animal but after that 90 days i mean it oh so cows aren't meant to eat grain no they evolved eating grass grass and, and just like humans and insects yeah there's something else doesn't mm. hurt to mention that like um, chickens within the course of a day a cow out on pasture eats about a pound of insects every day mm. and researchers trying to devise like the perfect diet for industrial cattle um 
found that they started adding some recycled animal parts back into the diet to essentially replace those um, B vitamins and other minerals the cattle out on live grass were getting from the mm-hmm. um, from just, just the stuff they were grazing on. And the reason why I like to mention that is because people like to put animals into categories of carnivore, or omnivore, uh-huh. or herbivore. But the category herbivore often includes a little bit more than what we are taught. Right. Um, like chickens too. Like I don't, I don't yes. buy eggs that say vegetarian chickens because that means they're not free range. If they're free range, they're eating insects. Exactly. And you want your animals, just like you want yourself, to eat your natural ancestral diet. So for cows, that's grass and insects. Um, and then when they are corn and soy fed, it's genetically modified corn and soy, which contains vast amounts of glyphosate. Yeah. And then they're also given the antibiotics and the growth hormones. Alive. So, I mean, for a long time now, this has been, you know, the different dietary changes I've made and, and learning new things and experimenting. I do not eat a fucking bite of industrialized meat. I will not do it. Like, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes when we're on the road, like stop at a taco shop or something and the person I'm with will just like order the beef tacos. I'm like, oh my God. What, okay. What about an in and out burger? I don't, I don't, you don't eat, eat it. No, I, I have in the past. And um, so those are grain fed, Yeah, but they are not given antibiotics mm. or growth hormone and they are That's slaughtered good. a day or two before they are consumed really mm-hmm. <gasps> they, they don't freeze that they day? freeze it for like a day really? to transport yes oh my god in and out burger just always doing a little bit better than what the others are. yeah it's a little better it's, it, little it's not better. perfect but like no. i feel okay with my daughter eating it. she loves it we yeah. only eat it more on road trips once or twice a year and yes, it's like yes. okay you can eat that burger yeah. i'll have some fries yeah that's interesting i've i've gone on to the other side of that spectrum lately um i you know after you know starting to eat meat again after being a vegetarian i was the same you know at the in a similar place to you just you know i've got my grass-fed stuff i've got my good quality meat and if i'm out I'll either, if they have a good option on the menu, I'll do that. But if not, I'll just eat vegetarian. I did that for a long time and maybe I will do that again. But maybe about two or three years ago, I just said, you know what? I'm just going to eat what's available and I'm just going to welcome that. I'm not stressed about it. I'm not stressed about it. And just, and even while I'm eating industrial meat, really appreciate the vitality I am receiving and really honor those animals lives Mm because I'm such a hardcore animal rights person that I almost maybe this sounds crazy but when I'm out in the mainstream of society and I'm eating Foster's chicken when I'm doing that I'm honoring those animals and I am literally praying that one day those systems won't be happening anymore Mm -hmm. and that's something that feels really good to me yeah that said I'm not telling you like go eat some well, gross and chicken again we're lucky we we live in a place where there is a whole fucking organization Nevada yeah. County free-range beef raising yeah. cows for us on pasture for us and we can go to our local yes. co-op and buy it we can and so we're privileged we are we very are. food privileged we are here yeah you don't have those same options in a lot of areas unless you can buy your way out of that i mean if you have money you can live anywhere in the states and get terrific stuff oh yeah or get shit yeah ship you just to get you shipped wherever to. go to you us wellnessmeats.com us wellnessmeats.com but if you don't oh. have money if you're not because even for us, I mean, this stuff is double the price of the conventional, mm. just across the board. Mm-hmm. And you and I both have made, well, we've both been living pretty, not, let's just say not financially high off the hog, but we've chosen to spend our money that way. And yeah. there's maybe a certain amount of privilege in the level of education that we have, mm-hmm. but financially you and I, and especially you for the past several years, we have not been living financially privileged at all well yeah for me too it um I started working at the co-op in 2005 and I just yeah made the decision like this is just it's just worth it for me to spend more money on organic food and 
So just at this point, I mean, Owen and I are always like budgeting. And then we like go to the grocery store and we're like, what the fuck? We spend so much money on food. And actually there's like nothing better to spend money on than the food that literally becomes your body. So we like decided recently to stop complaining about it Mm -hmm. and just to accept that we spend the amount of money on food that we do. Family of four, like we got to eat. We're growing vegetables too. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. So I want to make it really clear again. The liver doesn't store toxins. No, it doesn't. It now in a in a healthy in a, animal human. It doesn't. And also and this, human. Is, this is a point that Victoria Lafont enlightened me to. She's a wonderful holistic nutritionist from our area. So what happens with those toxins, say in an industrial animal or an industrialized human, they flow through the liver and they will do a certain amount of damage to the liver and they will deposit in the fat and the bones. So the toxins, if the animal is being raised in less than ideal conditions, and for humans as well, the toxins will flow through the liver. They will cause some level of ulceration or irregularity in the tissues, but the place they actually deposit is in the bones and the fat. And that makes perfect sense from the point of view of animals and what we are, which is our bones is our most concentrated, most high density, long-term storage place. Um, And then... Next up from that would be the nervous system and the organs, and then the muscle meat, and probably just the general blood and um, lighter tissues. That's like this, the, the covering, the less least dense part of the body. So if you are eating industrialized animals, go for the muscle meat. Don't go for bone broth or mm-hmm. organ meat. Mm-hmm. And you know, for anyone out there listening, thinking. <clears throat> That meat is too expensive. I literally cannot afford it. Just make informed choices that are kind to yourself and your family. And if you if you have to buy industrial meat, do that and bless it and just be grateful for it. Because we'll say there's a lot of people on the planet that literally don't have enough to eat. That's mm-hmm. real. Mm-hmm. And so here in the West, we're always talking about like our food choices, but how fucking privileged is that Mm -hmm. that we can even make food choices yeah that we can spend so much time reading and research researching and tripping out and what's best oh my god how are the avocados like (laughs) wow wow um and another thing i'll mention is these days with the food prices going up the way they are it actually makes sense for a family to grow their own food again oh yeah and when you're talking about your grocery bill being high i'm on the other side of that where we spend about 400 a month for a family of four at the grocery store. I used to think that was a lot, 400 a month. And I've been enlightened by my friends that most of them for a family of four are spending somewhere between 1000 and 1200 a month. Yeah. And that's buying high quality groceries. But the reason why we don't spend as much is because we raise our own meat. Right. And chickens. Yes. If I didn't have to buy eggs, we buy like yes. three or four carns of eggs a week. Yes. Yes. You guys... I, I really recommend you guys considering chickens for this property. I think you guys could do that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you in this day and age, even a like a suburban lot, you could grow a kick-ass garden, maybe have three birds out back, and you are going to really whittle away on your food bill. And what an amazing way to connect yourself with the land, save money, get your kids doing something great. Get their and, hands in the dirt. Yeah, and I will say... It's not all sunshine and roses. You know, you're going to lose animals. You're going to have things that don't work. You're going to be tired and just don't want to do it. Yeah, Mila Um, always talks about that on Instagram. People will say, oh, your life is so dreamy, so dreamy. And she's like, you know how fucking hard it is to raise your own animals? It's so much fucking work. Vegetables. um, Yes, it is. But it's good work. It's work that when you're done it, you have a sense of accomplishment. It's not like... Some, I mean, I don't get that same level of achievement from laundry, although I'm trying to cultivate that energy now. I really am. And this whole movement, of course, is just like growing, exploding across the country. So it it's, it's possible that there's a farm in your area that you don't know about that you can get good meat from. And Yes. And maybe um, you could even go and volunteer there and do mm-hmm. some work trade because almost all farmers are insanely overworked. You want to go there and work for a few hours and maybe take home some meat from the freezer. That Those kind of deals are out there. Yeah. I want to say something I just thought of, too, going back to my herb teacher, Cami. I, I remember her saying, and this has just stuck with me so much, that 
a vegan vegetarian diet works for some people some of the time. Few people can do it their whole lives and not really thrive. Yeah, no, not 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 have terrible health. Like some people constitutionally can kind of pull that off. Yes, yes, I agree. Um, but she said never women for their whole lives and absolutely never women. pregnant, breastfeeding, postpartum, childbearing women, never childbearing women. Yes. Yes, I I completely agree. And that every single traditional culture supports that too. Like the, they bring the pregnant or breastfeeding woman, Chicken the broth, marrow, the eggs, liver. Yeah. Liver. Yes, yes. In Chinese medicine, there's a tradition of um, egg feeding, postpartum egg feeding. <laughs> One of my professors um, back at school in Canada said she she almost can never eat another egg because she said after she had the baby, her husband's mother just hovering over her, right? Because <laughs> when in China or, you know, traditional cultures, when you have a baby, you don't do anything for yourself for another couple months. You lay in bed, breastfeed, and people bring you food. Hmm. That's considered normal. And because they still live with a group... There's older women that are available to do that for you. Mm-hmm. I mean, she said she laid in bed with her baby and her mother-in-law brought her eggs. And she said she ate up to nine eggs a day. <laughs> um, and, and that's supposed to help the child's eyesight for the rest of their life. And it makes perfect sense because mm-hmm. in the egg, vitamin A and D, mm-hmm. which is what we both, we all know, supports your eyes. It's supposed to transfer right through your breast milk. Um, so yeah, tell mm-hmm. us a little bit more about the nutrients that are in liver and mm-hmm. and why your grass fed so liver pills sell so yes, well, especially yes. to women. Ooh, they do. Um, yeah, I take them every day, and yes. I have been taking them every day. I got over my it's so hard for me to remember to take things thing. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, the liver pills. Let's see. So, so many of us women, we just feel. To me, it was almost this emptiness and ungroundedness deep inside this feeling of like not being fully connected on the earth and that's what liver gave me Mm -hmm. um and that's a really macro way of describing it but um let's see so liver it contains iron it contains vitamin a and d And it contains all the B vitamins, including folate, also known as folic acid, which, you know, I won't go into that. But those are things that are present in liver in a synergistic package that your body can take in and just build quality blood from. And then it just uses that blood to heal yourself. So liver can almost... It can heal your body of all sorts of different things. It will give you more energy almost instantaneously. It's, I mean, I could just, I, I almost sometimes think I sound ridiculous talking about liver because it's like someone being like, it, it will cure everything. And, you know, it won't necessarily do that for everyone. But if your inner voice is saying, I want liver, and if you've got, Anything ranging in that anemia, overexhausted, overwhelmed. If you're a mom autoimmune. at all. Yes. And if you've given birth and breastfed babies, liver can almost just bring you back to life. If you feel depleted yes. in any way. Um, and little kids love it. I remember watching you feed Axel and Guy the the capsules and them chewing it and being like, your kids are weird. Um, but Nixie now loves the cat she just chews on it and yes. just swallows that yes. that powder yes. so it's um it's good for kids it's powder it's yes. dehydrated powdered yes yes i take so we take the livers we um trim them of their fat and tendons and then um puree them and then dehydrate them and then we take the dehydrated liver and and um, pulverize that again so it becomes a fine powder and then that's put in the capsules so once that hits your digestive system it's just like liver city um very easy to absorb there's some other brands on the market that are like a press capsule like they take the liver powder and use some fillers to make it into a hard tablet those i would never recommend because your stomach is not going to dissolve those before Mm -hmm. they start to move through your gut Mm -hmm. if you're buying liver pills definitely get the kind that's a powder in a capsule Mm -hmm. um yeah children love them i you know as children naturally kids have a wild and diverse palate 
most kids. Some kids that have some severe gut dysbiosis from birth don't have a wild adventurous palate, but a typical healthy kid does. And if you offer them stuff, you'll be shocked by what they like. And you'll be also shocked if you take your kids out in the woods foraging by what they find to eat, which will be bugs. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Something that children have always naturally collected in hunter-gatherer society. But every kid I've ever met has liked liver. If they got to it early enough, maybe by age three or four, if kids have been eating a lot of cereals, grains, sweet foods, they may have lost that side of their palate. Yeah, like you were saying, I think for people our age, for adults, it's really Really hard hard. to acclimate to eating liver. So I think for some people it is, although other people just take to it, Mm -hmm. too. Um, And I also think you can if you want to learn to like liver you can but it might take you a couple years Mm -hmm. okay Suze anything else you want to say or talk about oh my goodness um hmm I mean yes but I feel fulfilled (laughs) at this moment I feel fulfilled as well um and we're going to be giving away a bottle of liver pills exactly to the patreon supporters of the show so i'll probably talk about that when i record the intro to this um thank you so much you've given me so much you're the most giving person i think that i've ever known wow well i am a turkey medicine person what does that mean oh i i don't know i mean it's just something i've just always liked to give i just i like doing that (laughs) just is that what turkeys it's just fun for me well, there. So, okay, this is just from that super cheesy animal medicine card deck. Mm-hmm. But actually, I think the authors really did research it pretty well with a council of Native American elders, and someone else maybe will email us to give us more information. But the turkey was considered the giving eagle by many Native American cultures because they're so easy to kill, uh-huh. <laughs> and you know they're just delicious. And they're they were in abundant food stores, and they were called the giving eagle because they gave of their bodies so freely. <laughs> and I've always loved turkeys. And then when I found out about that giving eagle thing, I was like, wow, that is so me because I just have always liked giving presents and getting presents. That's your main love language, right? I'd, I'd say, yeah, give, getting presents and then having people listen to me and mm. love that. Mm. Is that one of the official five love languages? That I think that was quality time. Quality time category. Mm. Quality time and gifts for me would be my main love, love languages. Yeah. What were yours again? Acts of service is oh, my first one. See, that's why we're perfect together. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's true. Just being helped. Yes. Which is kind of like being listened to because it's being seen. Um, And then I think words of love or whatever is next, but it's pretty far down there compared to acts of service. Quality time. Mm -hmm. Quality time. I think was next, actually. But gifts. Couldn't care less. Even physical touch is one of my lowest ones, too. It's always hard for my partners. I know. I'm like, oh, yeah. It's fairly low for me, too. Stroke. I love you. I know. I know. It doesn't, I mean, to me, often my husband will come up and try and give me some sort of embrace. And it's very annoying because, you know, they always come up when you're washing dishes, right? Your butt just looks so great in front of the sink and they just (laughs) glom on. and Uh, Right in the middle of something and you just kind of freeze like, I do love you too, Pat. Yeah. But I was just about to do this. Yes. Whereas for most men, it seems that the physical touch is a huge love language for them. Do you think that's true across the board? I think it's probably pretty true. Yeah. Yeah, which could just be enculturation in a lot of ways or just this um, idea of, like, access to the woman's body is your right at all times. Uh. Um, I think this is something a lot of women, moms, wives need to do without maybe realizing it for many years is um, just kind of set those boundaries throughout the day or Mm -hmm. be like, oh, you want to have sex right now. I just made to-do list is a thousand things long. I just can't but... You know, I don't know. Yeah. I, it's it's definitely something we talk about a lot. Like spontaneity is hard for moms. It's it really is. hard. It is because our mental to do list is so prevalent that to disconnect from that to get into a sensual space is so hard. It's so hard. Um, John Gray, yes. Mars and Venus. I think I, I talked about this in um, the episode where I talked about mothering without the village. I think that was episode eleven that he really taught me. You can think he's cheesy, as I did until Susie oh, pointed out that he's good. not. And he's I started good. reading. Um, and, you know, yeah, you can, like, tear apart the 
binary um, stereotypes, but there's so much truth to them, which is why they're such good sellers. So he talks about how women have a never ending to do list in their head. And this is now what is so trending as emotional labor, women's invisible labor. And men just don't. They're just some how they're not tracking everything. They, They can put stuff out of their mind when they know they can't deal with it. They can just dump it. Yeah. Whereas we don't. We're tracking. I'm tracking what's happening next year. I'm tracking what's happening next month, next week, today, tomorrow. And so... infinity, the end of our species. Yeah. (laughs) So it's so hard to put that down and be sexual. Yeah. It's just, I I gotta have, at this point in my life, I have to have that time card. Like, okay, 8 p.m. Tuesday, we're having sex. Then I can, like, get there if I can mentally prepare to let go for a yes. while. And also maybe even ask your husband or partner for some support to help get you there. Like, okay, this is our date night. You're going to put her to bed and do the dishes while I spend an hour in the bath with my book. And that, to me, that kind of stuff, I always thought was so cheesy. and like, does that even work? But I will say, I think it does work. I think, you know, chore play as they call it, I think it's real. I mean, even when my oh, nipples got burned, yeah, thinking about yeah. those men washing dishes, yeah. just thinking about, as a woman, how there's little things they can do in the household in a very direct way that will lead to sex. Yeah. They lead to de-stressing you so you can get to that playful place. Yes. All right. Mm. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. Thank you, Suze. I love you. Love you, too. Thank you for taking these medicine stories in. I hope they inspire you to keep walking the mythic path of your own unfolding self. I love sharing information and will always put any relevant links in the show notes. You can find my blog, Handmade Herbal Medicines, and a lot more at mythicmedicine.love. While you're there, be sure to click the black banner across the top of the page to take my quiz, Which Magical Herb is Your Spirit Plant? It's a fun and lighthearted quiz, but the results are really in-depth and designed to bring you into closer alignment with the medicine that you're in need of. If you love the show, please consider supporting my work at patreon.com slash medicine stories. Um, there's some cool rewards there, like exclusive content, free access to my herbal ebook and online course, and the ability to chat with me. I am a crazy busy and overwhelmed mom and adding another project into my life with this podcast is a questionable move, but I'm also so excited about it and just praying that the Patreon will allow me the financial wiggle room to keep doing it. Another way that you can support if that's not an option is to head over to iTunes and subscribe and review the podcast. That would be super helpful. Thank you. And thank you to Marie Sue for providing the music that I use. That's Marie with two E's, S-I-O-U-X. This is from her song, Wild Eyes, one of my favorites. Uh, Check out Marie Sue. Beautiful music. Thank you, and I look forward to next time. Bye.